Hello and welcome to today's mini masterclass with me, James Roy from Westwards, episode 41. I don't know where they've all gone. It's amazing. We've been doing this for some time now and we've covered off a lot of things, but this is the first time we'll be talking to a real life in the flesh publisher. So today we're going to be talking about pitching and how you pitch your document or your manuscript or how you approach a publisher and the best way to do it. And we've got one of the best in the room today. I'm talking today to Erica Wagner. How are you, Erica? I'm well, thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us. Um, so you and I have been working on a few other projects around the traps, but the other day when we'd finished a meeting, I thought, I need someone to come and talk to us about how to pitch their manuscript to a publisher because this is something that I, I suppose every writer, when they when they start writing something, initially they go, I'm just writing this because I just need to get it on the page. But then at some point they reach the point where they go, this would be really good if this was out in the world. I mean, there is that kind of vague narcissism, I guess, that writers have where they actually want their words seen. And so you've been around these people for a long time. Just a little bit of background on you, Erica. You were at Allen and Unwin most recently and you were there for, what was it, 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. And then um, now I'm freelancing. So I'm still doing some publishing. I work with publishers and do a lot of project managing. Okay. Uh, yeah. But and I prior- started off at Penguin, uh, right. Penguin Books for 10 years and then started a little micro uh, list for Duffy and Snellgrove, which was called Silverfish. Right. And then, then then that moved to Allen and Unwin. And uh, I also have a micro press at the moment with two other people, which is a focus on graphic novels. You're allowed to only published two, five uh, years apart. Right. Okay. So micro, micro press, sort of like a micro yeah. brewery in a sense. Yeah. Except exactly. I'm sure you don't serve. The, we've got a micro brewery up here in Katoomba <laughs> and we they serve... Um, Potato gems. So you get you get your you get your craft beer and a bucket of potato gems. It's kind of cool. Anyway, I digress. So today uh, I thought we'd have a chat about all this kind of pitching stuff. Now I know that when we we're talking about this the other day, you said that you, you had been approached over the years on many occasions to go to these small festivals and do the pitching panels. How do you find those? They can be a bit difficult, can't they? Yes. Well, um, in recent times for the ASA, I've actually been doing sessions to authors talking about pitching. I personally haven't actually participated as a publisher in those speed dating things that much. I have done it a couple of times. It is super awkward because (laughs) you really put on the spot. I think it's really, really tense for the authors. And it's, it's kind of so speedy that you've got to sort of think, really think on your feet. And you hope that people are getting something from it. But I think they've developed now into something that's actually quite useful because now they have an array of publishers. They sometimes have an agent or two as well. And it's just a good way of getting direct feedback. And and that's what I hear from the writers, that it's really nice that they're speaking to a real live person. I think publishers often have people who, I guess they've got their preconceived ideas of about how judgmental the publisher is or or what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh, this is terrible or whatever. And it's usually not that at all. It's usually their focus is, is this something for my publishing house for the books that I'm responsible for? And that means they might be responsible for publishing 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 books a year. And they're thinking to themselves, is this going to fit in with all the other books that I've got in my program? So it's not so much judging it simply as a work of art or literature on its own merits, it's will it work for my publishing house? And I think that's the key thing that I think people need to know so that, yes, it might, it, it is a qualitative judgment, but it's also, is this right for me? It's, it's interesting that you, you mentioned that because a, a mutual friend of ours, Leonie, uh, Leonie Tile, who was my yeah. first publisher, she she told me once, I hope I'm not misquoting her, but she said to me that what really gets to her is when she hears people saying that or, or implying that all publishers want to do is um, destroy people's dreams. Yeah, yeah. And she just wants to say to them, no, every time I open a manuscript, I really hope I'm opening the yeah. next, you know, Harry Potter or something that's going to make all of us lots of money and make someone incredibly exactly successful. Lots exactly. of readers really happy. That's really the – but I think it's easy as a – as a writer, when you kind of spend this glacial process in isolation where you, it's very easy to assume that, that you're not going to make it or that, that there are people looking out for problems in, in your work. 
and I guess that's probably part of the thing with the pitch session, isn't it? The people you you have to say something constructive, but you also want to say something that isn't going to destroy them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think, yeah, there's a couple of things there. I think I think what it is is this sense of that the publishers are sort of out there, you know, looking for work and that they've got all this money at their disposal, they've got all these resources at their disposal and they really should be just taking on as many books as they possibly can. And that's, I think, part of what needs to happen and hopefully happens at those pitching things is that the publishers can explain a little bit more about what's actually going on because, uh, yes, they're always looking. Like there's nothing more fantastic than discovering somebody that hasn't been published before, a fresh new voice or a really brilliant idea or or someone that you think, oh, wow, they've got so much potential or you see this beautiful artwork and you can't wait to match them with a really good story or whatever it is. Um, so there's always that being on the lookout, but then there's also the reality of the fact that it is very competitive and the the publishers are competing with each other. They're all competing for a market share, for a readership, and um, Bruce Sims, when I first started at Penguin Books, he was the adult fiction publisher there, and he said he described it as this um, clash between the sort of commercial and a cultural product. Mm-hmm. So the, the publishers, yes, they need to make money, but they are also very, very aware that they're in the business of cultural product, yeah. if you want to call it that, and and it's you always weighing that up. And you often hear publishers saying, well, we need those really best-selling authors in order to subsidise some of the ones that don't necessarily sell that well. Mm. And there is that truism, which is actually true, that yeah. 80% of your profit come from 20% of your books. Well, I remember being at... Um... Yeah. You know, every time I've been to Somerset Festival, which has been quite a few times, and there's always somebody like, you know, Andy Griffiths or somebody in the big in the big room yeah. with, you know, 500 kids and, and yeah. you go, okay, and they've got kids queued up for an hour to sign books and you go, it's because of those people that, I mean, they could ho- probably get the, a close to that number of people along to the festival with just that name, but yeah, it also allows the rest of us to be there and expose what we do and, and share and so forth. So, yeah, you, yeah. And I guess and it's the same need, sort of thing. Yeah, and you need the breadth, like especially when you're publishing for children's and children and young adults, it's, I mean, we know every single child and young adult is different. There's going to be a book that is just right for every t- every individual. Mm. And so you need to offer a an array of books. But that's when it gets super interesting, like for the very big publishers, they will sort of divide their list into sort of uh, kinds of books so that you might, they might specialise in very commercial books for young kids and then maybe more literary and artistic things. But you you need the breadth Mm. and that's what their their antennas are going like that when they're listening to the pictures or looking at the manuscript and they're sort of thinking, where does this slot into all these different areas that we've got on our list? Yeah, I remember being at one of the... um... I think you've probably done this festival, the the uh, New South Wales Writers Centre um, Children's Festival, and they had one of these pitch sessions, and there were a whole there were I think four or five of us on the panel, and and this young young writer stood up to read his work, and um, a young Asian guy, and he stood up and he he read his work. It was very funny because he was talking about you know sitting on a bus, thinking oh these bloody Asians all on the bus, and then then mm-hmm. reveals that he's he he's an Asian uh, protagonist. And we all were listening to this going, this is fantastic. This is hysterical. It's it's really well constructed. And, of course, that young man was Oliver Pomervan, and, and oh, right, everyone yeah. knows who Oliver is now. And, yeah, and, yeah. And so I, I think there are some really positive things to come out of these pitch sessions. Yeah. I think sometimes I feel a bit, perhaps a little bit cottage industry, but there are some real, there are some big fish out there in that pond, aren't there? Definitely. I think it's definitely worth doing. And I guess, I mean, fundamentally, before you go to the pitch, I reckon it's really important that the manuscript or whatever it is that you're talking about is as good as you can make it. Like I think often people say they've got a fabulous idea or they've got a, but they haven't necessarily developed it or spent time with it and made it as good as it can be. And so my bottom line is always before you go to the pitch, before you even formulate what your pitch is, make sure that you've made that manuscript or whatever it is as strong as you can possibly make it. 
those of us in the industry have all heard funny stories and, and strange stories about people pitching. Leonie again, she she relates the story of having a, a writer try and pass a manuscript under the toilet stall. And, and, you know, there's all sorts of responses she could have had at that moment. What's the strangest or most unusual pitch you've had from people? Oh, dear. That's, that's a tricky one to answer. I guess I've blocked out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that in the early days, like you'd get this enormous sort of uh, balloon or chocolates or some sort of thing or a very fancily sort of, um, you know, wrapped uh, object. But I would always be a little bit suspicious, I'm sorry to say, about that kind of approach. Yeah, well, there um, is that but... apocryphal story about the, the publisher that got the um, the romance manuscript submitted and and it had talcum powder in it to make it smell nice, but, of course, it ended up shutting down the entire publishing house yeah. for several hours while Hazmat came out and dusted the place for anthrax. So, oh, you know, no. probably, maybe just maybe just send the manuscript, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. But well, it, it, it is true. And I, look, there's been sometimes you felt a bit hounded or someone's, you know, really been chasing you, and, and that's very off-putting. Like, mm. it, it's very off-putting to feel hounded because you think, well, you know, it's actually putting me off now, but anyway... <laughs> Mia culpa here. I I remember contacting. It was something really urgent that I felt needed to be dealt with about a book coming out, and I contacted my publisher on a mobile, and it was a I think it was a Saturday morning, and I, I'm oh, embarrassed yeah. to admit it. And she she's she's a very kind person, and but at the end of the call, she said, "I'm oh, by the way, I'm not at work right now," and and it was easy. It, it was easy to forget that as a writer because as a yeah. writer, you're you're always working. You know, yeah, even when you're exactly. going for a walk around the block, you're always working. And so yeah. you kind of think, well, this is my passion, but it's also my my job. And why shouldn't you all be, always be on call? Yeah. Um, so that's a good thing, to, I think, for, for people to remember is that yes. publishers aren't, aren't yeah. at your beck and call at all hours. Yeah, and they're humans as well. And they also get stressed out and they might be have, coping with a whole lot of deadlines and things that have to go to the printer. And so they're just not in a headspace to be mm. able to look at something new in the right kind of way which I think is why publishers now are doing so much of that, uh, you know, like the Walker Wednesday or the, you know, Friday pitch for Alan and Unwin, all these different ways that people can submit work because then when it is submitted, it's going to be looked at in the right kind of way. It's not necessarily that you send in the entire manuscript, but you're just sending in a little bit and they can then on the on the occasion when they sort of getting together to look at those uh, the material that's come in, they can make those judgments with their minds ready to be receptive to the new mm. thing. And obviously that isn't actually how it is because publishers are getting submissions all the time from agents, they're getting them from authors that they've already published, they're getting them from all all directions. Often really good things come to publishers through other published authors. You know, I used to sometimes get someone ringing me up and saying, you really should look at this person's work. I'd met them at wherever. And and so things like that, those linkages can be really good as well. So, so kind of pursue that a little bit. I remember a, a very, uh, very prominent figure in the publishing, children's publishing world in this country, telling me that at, at their particular publishing house, they were getting I can't remember what the figure was, but a stupid number of manuscripts every year. Yeah. And out of that, they were publishing 20, maybe 25 titles. Yeah. And the hit, the hit rate was extraordinarily low. And I said, to, I said to them, I'm glad I didn't hear this before I started getting published because I would have probably just given up. And they yeah. said, what you've got to remember is that a large number of those manuscripts, while they count in the figures, are never really going to be considered because they're they're very yeah. subpar. So yeah. what what makes a manuscript jump out to you? I, I guess we're going a little bit cut before horse here. We'll we'll yeah. come back to some other things. But in in, yeah. in the interim, what sort of things really make a, a manuscript jump out at you? It's just um yeah, well, it's what we've been saying recently. It's the story, it's the characters, it's the voice, it's the language, it's the you just think you're in good hands. Mm. It makes you laugh. Like it makes you think. You think, "Wow, this is really, really good," and it's um, it touches you. It affects you. You can see its potential, and but it's there's a kind of a. I think it's this authorial voice. It, it's that sort of you can trust it. It's not going to play tricks with you. You can just relax into it. You can absorb this story. You might read it and think, oh, it would be better if maybe this happened or that happened, but there's 
substantially something really winning about it. And by winning, I mean you just love that character or that voice is, wow, so unique, you've never heard it before. Or there's just something about it that makes you think this this is great. And for me, see, that's where publishers are all different. So um, I think all publishers would probably answer that question in a similar way. It's just that sort of sense that you just know, you just know this is something special. This rises above all the others um, because you do see the same kinds of stories over and over again. You see the mm. same sort of themes, and especially when something's popular, you know, then you'll suddenly see a whole lot of other books that are trying to do the same kind of thing. And that isn't necessarily always a bad thing. It just means that it's uh, some feel like they're derivative, they're sort of a bit lame or whatever it is, and then there's others that take an original slant on that very popular idea. And it's I I'm very instinctive, so I would always think I'd get the sort of hairs on the back of the neck, like it's a bit cliched, but I, I would get those feelings and I think this is something really special. And I learned how to trust that. I was sometimes misled by that mm-hmm. because I think you do invest well, it's what you said right at the beginning, like the writers write so that there's an audience and there's an, a sort of this interaction between the words on the page and the reader and the reader invests themselves in those words. So sometimes I, w- I think I would over-invest myself in the words and I would maybe see things that weren't there. <laughs> so that when you actually came down to editing it, you think, oh, I thought this was amazing. And then um, suddenly you think, oh, actually, you know, and you realise that you had I'd put myself into it too much. So I would sometimes get into a bit of a knot at that stage. But that's where it gets a bit complex, though, isn't it? When, yeah. when you go, this is a brand new writer here. Yeah. Um, there, this work is really promising, and I can see real potential in them in them as a writer. And maybe this book yeah. isn't going to the be the one yeah. that breaks records, but down the track they're going to be astonishing. Whereas if you got something of that standard from someone whose work you knew, you might go, they're they're writing a bit below what I know they're capable of. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is it. Like. I, I used to always think of it like a forest or a garden or something. Like you need your um, new authors who are like new little shoots and you've got to encourage them and you've got to let them fulfil their potential. Then you've got to look after your sort of sort of mass lower shrubs <laughs> and you've got to sort of nurture them so that they can keep growing. And then you've got your great big trees who are often amazing, but then they'll fall over. <laughs> they might, fit, you know, they might pass away or whatever or they or they they sort of it's it's time for them to pass so you've always got to have this juggling of people beginning middle and end career and towards the end of my working in house at Alan and Unwin I, I kept it was a bit of a joke but I said I specialize in the older author because I did I did have a lot of older authors and I often feel like they needed as much, they needed to feel reinvigorated. Like often they had been typecast or they only do this kind of book and they wanted to try something new. They wanted to feel supported in experimenting. And and I think this, um, I'm sort of ranging around a bit, but maybe it's making an important point that when publishers are looking at a brand new author, they're hoping to build a relationship with them. They want to nurture them through their career. They would like this to be not just one book. They would like it to be more than one book. And, you know, that's part of the conversation as well. You need to think, can I work with that person? Is that someone that I actually feel that we're aligned, like we can work work constructively together? So if so, let's let's play hypotheticals here. Let's say that I'm a I'm a brand new writer. Yeah, I've written fifteen thousand words of a a really what I think is a really really good young adult novel, children's novel, grown up yeah. novel, whatever it might be, and I'm confident that it's really good. At what point do I start looking for publishers, or or at what point do I start looking for agents, or do I do I yeah. pitch to someone and 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 hope they go, oh, this is good. Can you finish it for us? Here's lots of money. What yeah. what is the how would I approach this as a as a new writer? It's interesting when it's a novel. I think um, there's sort of two schools of thought. If you've written fifteen thousand words and the overall it's going to be about sixty or seventy, that's it. It's 
sometimes like you can write that much and you might not be able to sustain it over the length. So I, what's going to happen is the publisher's going to say, oh, that's fantastic. If they like it, they're going to say, that's fantastic. Where's, you know, I want to see the whole thing. And then you have to say, oh, well, I haven't written, <laughs> written the whole thing. And then it might be quite a long time before you get back to them and then maybe the world's changed slightly. Mm. So it's slightly dangerous. I would generally, I mean, you're trying to test the waters. So you could, if you're pretty clear, you've written your 15,000 words, you're pretty clear about where it's going and what you want to do with it, given that it might change a bit as you continue working on it. It's probably good to test the waters a bit. I would advise you now, if, if you were talking to me now, I'd say go on, like just submit it. Submit it to those pitch things like the mm. Friday pitch or whatever where they only want to see the first three chapters or something anyway. They want to get have a bit of a synopsis. They want you to, to do that beautiful, you know, one-liner, one couple of sentences. Elevator pitch. Elevator kind of pitch, yep. which is going to make you think, oh, I, you know, I really want to read that book. And then they want to get a taste of your writing. So I would just say start doing that. Uh, it's really interesting when I well, yeah. sorry sorry to interrupt sorry. Uh, it's really interesting when I talk to new writers and and they ask for advice and they say and I always say to them, so what's your elevator pitch? And they go, what do you mean? You go, just tell me what the book's about. Yeah. Oh, I haven't got much time. I don't want much time. I need you to tell me because that, yeah, yeah. in a sense, makes them process what it's about. And I'm always I always say to them if they really struggle to give me that elevator pitch, I say. It feels like you don't really even know what it's about yet. Yeah, that's it's not something ready. you're really yeah. good. So yeah. there's that. But the other question I had for you was: people feel it seem, and I, I admit I'm one of these people sometimes, a bit kind of blurry on what does a synopsis mean? It's not a blow yeah, by blow yeah. plot outline. What is a synopsis? How does that work? Yeah, well, that's. It. I think you just have to give yourself a word limit because uh, you don't want to read a synopsis that goes on for five pages. You want the synopsis to be maybe three paragraphs. So it, it is kind of the plot and especially this, so it doesn't matter if you're doing a bit of spoilers unless your spoiler is a really key thing that is revealed right at the very end of the book and will wreck the experience if they already know it. Mm. But you could then you in your synopsis you'd say and then there's, you know, something I'm not going to tell. Like you're trying to tease someone. Like you, I guess a one way of thinking about it is you're with your friends you're telling them about a movie that you really like so that you might say, oh, it's about someone who lost their memory and then, um, you know, woke up and realised they were a frog or something. Uh, sorry, terrible pitch. <laughs> but that would be your short I'd be thing. encouraging you to go away and workshop that one, Erica. <laughs> But then, then you would, um, then you would, then they'd say, "Oh, how does that work? You know what happens? Well, he starts off, you know, the frog's in the pond, and then, you know, somebody hits it with a rock, and it loses its memory. So, so you're trying to just tell it in a way that is uh, tells a little story. So, it's a sort of story of the story in a way, and you're trying to tease the person that you list that you submitting it to it's like mm. I just want to know what happens so you've sent me the beginning you know whatever the novel is uh I'm pretty interested there's some interesting characters there's some sort of key dilemma that you're already hinting at you're getting a feel for what the sort of central problem is and then it might be that the synopsis just tells me and then you know the character goes on some journey he does she does this does that and the outcome is this you certainly so, wouldn't be saying that's all i've got i'm not sure what happens after that because that's going to set off alarm bells that would be you, off-putting that yes. would be <laughs> off-putting you, you just want it to sound intriguing and um even just looking at, i i kind of think it's a little bit like some of those more detailed blurbs that you get on the back of the book because the other thing i was going to just say about pitching in general when you are pitching to a publisher um, and agents do this pretty well. So the agents will do like a couple of lines um, and then they'll do a more detailed summary of it. And it might be more of a summary rather than a synopsis. And it might also be a, you know, what are the main thing, points of difference? Like what is different about this story or whatever it is? 
Uh, and w- or what is it responding to in the zeitgeist? What is it responding to that's out in the world that feels really timely or really universal or, you know, something like that? So, so you're trying to sort of encapsulate why this book is, A, a great story, really well written or written in this amazing way that is so compelling, and then w- what is going to make it stand out in the world and what is going to attract readers to it? And what's fascinating is those actual words that are used in that actual initial pitch are then often used again and again and again to create this chain of enthusiasm. They're often tweaked and as the process develops and the publishing process goes on, but if you can supply those words to the publisher, they're going to love you because they wanted to publish your book because of those words that you used and then your manuscript actually delivered that experience and so that that's this chain of enthusiasm oh wow this person told me this and then I tell you that and then they tell the bookseller and they tell the reader and then uh, you know and then this word spreads and that's you know people always talk about word of mouth and Yes, word of mouth now takes place online and with all the blogs and all the other resources that are out there. But it's still essentially someone saying, wow, this is amazing. You should read it. You know, we all love it when someone says, oh, I just read this incredible book. You've got to read it. Like I I love that when people do that to me. One of our main bookshops here in the Blue Mountains, um, the children's specialist at that shop, uh, there's a new one, but the one that I used to work with, she she was a master of hand selling. And I remember she she sold me The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas, which I, I don't think is a perfect book. It's deeply flawed in lots of ways. Mm. But certainly it's been incredibly successful. And and when I yeah. she she hand sold me that and just said, You've got yeah. to read this. And it was interesting yeah. because at that point it was the children's edition. Uh, which was just the, the the stripe on the cover and no blurb. Yeah. The blurb just said something about this is a story about a fence. We hope you never encounter one of these fences in your life or something like that. Oh, right. and so I said to her, what's this about? And she said, I'm not going to tell you. You've got to read it. Oh, and then wow. they brought out the paperback version, the adult paperback version, and it had photos from uh, Auschwitz, I think, on the on the front cover. And immediately you knew it was a Holocaust book. Yeah. And that kind of, I thought, basically undermined this amazing word of mouth yeah you're talking about they had that going on and they undermined it for themselves I felt yeah that's so interesting and look I honestly I remember as well and I think I was in Sydney when this happened when Harry Potter the first Harry Potters had just come out and I was in a bookshop and they and it wasn't popular then yet you know it took a while it was a little groundswell and they said oh you've got to read this I'm looking at it you know like it was just it was I do remember that feeling and See, in reverse, I remember that when Paul Jennings was first published because I worked in a bookshop before I started this whole adventure and um, and I just remember being in the shop and the kids were coming in and asking for this book, you know, because they had heard of it and they had started passing it around with each other. So it's communicating the passion or the, the what's special, what's enjoyable. Like we all just love, I mean, uh, sorry, now I sound a bit evangelical, but like I think all of us in this area, like we love nothing more than to read a good book. Like I love nothing more still now than to read a really good book or a really good manuscript or a really good whatever it is. I love that whole being immersed in the world. And what's so exciting is when you see young people still having that experience and still liking that and you think, well, that's how we connect. It's such a sort of key part of our whole, you know, way to be in the world. And we could continue being evangelical for hours, Erica, you and I. We Sorry. Could, um, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to, but uh, we, we we haven't got all that much time left. So, um, Can I just say one yeah, thing? Yeah, of course. One thing, like the key thing with the pitching, I reckon, is what you mentioned earlier about the person who had trouble encapsulating the pitch. Like I reckon use that as a creative tool. Use the act of pitching. Like what is it? Who is it for and what's what inspired me? What made me want to write it? If you can convey those three things, that will be a good pitch. So that's good advice. It is creative because it forces you to say, you know, what it is or what your hopes are for it, even if you, you know, fake it till you make it. Like you just say it, you put it out there and then you rise to that challenge, I think. 
Well, I see it as being vaguely analogous to when you go and do a, um, and I think you're you're an artist, aren't you? You, you yeah, paint yeah. and draw. <laughs> and I remember when I went and did my little kind of community college drawing course for fun and yeah. they did this. They said, okay, he, I'm going to hold a pose. The teacher said, I'm going to hold a pose. You've got five minutes to draw it. And everyone's getting really yeah. detailed. And then she said, okay, now I'm going to do another pose. I'm going to hold it for a minute. Yeah. And then she said, now I'm going to hold another pose. I'm going to hold it for 10 seconds. It's yeah. like, holy crap. And then suddenly you're in there and you've got this amazing figure yeah. in front of you that you've drawn that is really the essence of the pose. Like, so I, I kind of see it as analogous gesture, to that, I guess. Like you, gesture, like you've yeah, got yeah. the gesture. Yeah, I completely get it, yeah. yeah. So, before we, so before we wrap up, Erica, I've just got a couple yeah. of very quick questions for you. The first one yes. is agent versus direct submission. It's something that people are often asking me and others. They say, yeah. or do I need an agent? Can I just submit directly? What's your, what's your advice to the that? The short answer is you don't need an agent. You can. There's all these facilities now to submit directly. However, some authors really like having an agent and the agents that I know and deal with are all terrific, professional, reliable, all those things. And some authors like it that the agent looks after the deal and the money side and the awkwardnesses that can sometimes arise. (laughs) And it means that the author can just have a sort of uh, direct creative relationship with the editor and the publisher Hmm. Uh, rather than having to negotiate the deal and all of that. So, look, it, it it's people say it's as hard to get an agent as it is to get a publisher, but it's also that's exactly the same thing to some extent in that the agent will take you on if they feel confident that they can sell your work because then it's happiness all round. So... And it is true that occasionally an agent will get you a better deal than if you went direct to the publisher. So, But on the other hand, they do take a cut. Mm-hmm. So that, that's all things that you need to consider. And there are a lot of very well-known authors who um, don't have agents and who manage to juggle all those roles happily. That was a long answer to your short No, question. that's a, <laughs> and it, and it's a, it's a perfectly good answer. Erica, thank you so much for talking to us today about all things, well, not all things, we could go on and on, but many yeah. things to do with submitting. I know that a lot of people do really balk at this process. They, As I say, they think that publishers are, are just wanting to you know, sit back and laugh as they crush the dreams of these new writers and more experienced no. writers. But, of course, that's not the case. We're all, we're all in this for the same reason, we hope. We're in it to hopefully be successful we're also to hopefully reach an audience and and share what we do with them so thank yeah. you for giving us your insights in that my and, pleasure uh, james thanks yeah. for asking me <laughs> no worries and we'll talk again soon okay all the yeah. best bye